All right, so today is our very last regular lecture. So we are almost done. You guys are almost to the end of your craziest semester in college. Someday, <laughs> I know, it's so sad. Someday y'all are gonna be sitting around with your grandkids and they're gonna ask you about the coronavirus days and you'll tell them about how you had to take a chemistry class online and it was so grueling and awful, but you made it. Ah, all right. So as I said, we're almost to the end and today we are finishing up chapter 12 and 13. So remember that's just one chapter. It's the solutions chapter depending on which book you have. The newer edition is chapter 13. The older edition is chapter 12. And then Monday is a holiday. Boo, no chemistry. Um, so it's a holiday so you have a little more time to study. And then exam four is going to be on Wednesday. Um, also coming up is the quiz on chapter 11. So the quiz you're gonna take on your own time. So I'm gonna set it to open Thursday morning. So like 12.01 a.m. it's gonna open up and it will be open all th through Saturday evening. So originally I was gonna do it Thursday and Friday, but a lot of people are working during the week and they would rather take it on the weekend. So you have from Thursday morning at 12.01 till Saturday at 11.59. It's gonna be a 40 minute time period. You might not need all of that time, but you'll have that time. And um, so just make sure you don't start it, you know, uh, Saturday night at 11.58 because it should end for you at 11.59. So make sure you give yourself 40 minutes to work on it. Um, so any questions about that upcoming quiz? And that quiz is on chapter 11. How questions? Okay, so I'm thinking that says how many questions? Um, and I can't remember exactly, I think it might be about six questions, but they are shorter questions because we didn't do very many calculations in um, chapter 11. So it's around six questions, I think. No, it's only on one chapter, it's only on chapter 11. Oh, the exam, I'm sorry, so the exam is right over here. So it says 11 through 13, but you know 12 and 13 is really one chapter, so this is two chapters. So it's 11 and then that 12 slash 13, so it's only on two chapters. Yeah, I know from the way it's written it looks like three, but it's only two. Yes, I will have you send in your scratch paper again, just like usual. Yes, it's either 12 or 13, depending on your book. So if you have the newer edition, which I believe is the fourth edition, it'll be chapter 13. If you have the third edition, it'll be chapter 12. So it should say the solutions chapter. It's going to be the chapter that contains the intermolecular forces. Yes. All right. Are there questions about that upcoming quiz or the exam? Okay, so our final week is going to be review on Monday and then the final exam on Wednesday. So that is our first week in June. Let's go ahead and switch to, let's see. I'm gonna switch to our Canvas site, give me just a sec. Oops, actually, before I go to the upcoming due dates, just to show you where you're going to find the chapter 11 quiz, it's right up here on the top right now. That link isn't live, so if you click on it, it doesn't take you anywhere. But um, come Thursday morning at 12.01 uh, a.m., this link will take you to the quiz. All right, so what we're doing today is we're finishing up that chapter 12 slash 13. Again, it's just the one chapter, depending on your edition of the textbook. Our lab, we are going to look at uh, lab C, and that is actually just a worksheet lab. So we're going to talk about our worksheet, and then um, you can either stay and do it as usual, or you can uh, take care of it at home. I'm hoping that you have lab 11 to turn in. And right now it says chapter 11 quiz Thursday through Friday, but I'm going to change that, and I will actually do that right now. 
So you don't have to worry that I'm going to change my mind Thursday through Saturday. So those people who are working all week uh, don't have to worry about uh, doing it during the week. There we go. All right, so chapter 11 quiz, you can take it anytime Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. You know our Zoom uh, URL or you wouldn't be here. So again, uh, Monday's a holiday. Wednesday, the, the exam uh, is at our usual time at 5 o'clock. Um, I would like you to turn in the homework for chapters 9 and 10 and 11, but just like always, whenever homework's due on an exam day, I will post the answer key the weekend before, so I'll probably post it up on Friday, so you have a chance to check over your work, and I do want you to first attempt the homework, then check your work, um, correct your work, please feel free to email me if you have any questions, and on the exam day, we won't have any lab. And then Monday of our last week, lectures review, lab, and during lab, we're going to do lab S, our separations lab. Lab C and lab S are going to be due. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to have you turn in lab S yet. Normally, if this was a regular semester, you would just turn in your data for me um, because I don't want you to have to worry about anything for the final exam day. So I haven't decided what, um, what I'm going to have you do for lab S in terms of what to turn in. But for the Lab C, um, that'll be just that worksheet that we are going to start working on today. And then Wednesday, uh, June 3rd, will be our very last day. That's our final exam. So any questions on anything coming up? So I am getting a lot of emails about the Summer 1B class. So uh, there were some technical glitches. We are in the process of opening up a second section. Originally, we were going to have it just wide open and anybody could register. Now we're going to do it in order of the uh, waiting list. So we are sending permission numbers to people in order. So um, if you haven't got a permission number yet, just hold on. We're going as quickly as we can. Our administrative assistant, Wendy Slater, is helping me. So she is currently doing the emails, um, sending those out. And on Friday, she's going to turn the whole list over to me, and then I will take over and start um, sending out those emails to get people registered for the new class. So I, I know it's tough to wait, but um, we're doing our best to get everybody moved over in order of the waiting list. And my hope is to try to get everybody into the class. So even if we reach that 36-person capacity, I'm going to try to um, add more people because I know everybody needs that class. So any questions about that, about the Summer 1B class or anything else? Some of you are like, no chemistry this summer, yay. <laughs> the rest of us will miss you. All right. So let's go back. All right, so we were working on this solutions chapter, chapter 12 or 13, depending on which uh, textbook you have. And I want to remind you of my beautiful artwork, uh, of what we were talking about over here, this application where we talked about as we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere it creates a partial pressure. That partial pressure essentially pushes it down into the water and makes it more soluble. So we can get more CO2 dissolved if we have a higher pressure of CO2 above. And I know it's kind of weird to talk about it uh, just, just talking without the numbers. And so those of you who are like, oh, I wish we could calculate this out so I could really see what's going on, today is your day. So this is called Henry's Law, and it talks about the solubility of a gas. So the solubility of a gas is governed by two things. One is a constant, and that constant would be given to you. And the other is that partial pressure of a gas. So this P gas right here, that was the CO2 that I had drawn above my beautiful picture of the ocean. So pressure of CO2 that was pushing down and pushing the CO2 down into the ocean. That is this right here. So the partial pressure of the gas above the liquid times the constant will tell us how soluble it is, how much we can dissolve, and we're going to be solving for that in molarity. So just to show you another example of that, I'm going to zoom in here. So here's a carbonated beverage, and before this person opens the bottle, there is a pressure. Oops, probably a little too big. There is a pressure of CO2 that is pushing down. And that pressure 
comes from the bottling plant. It's bottled under high pressure, and it is because of that pressure that all of this carbonation is possible. Now, as soon as this person opens the lid, they are effectively releasing this pressure of CO2. Once the CO2 pressure is gone, there's nothing to stop the CO2 from bubbling on out. So that's what we're talking about here. Once we have a pressure of the gas above a liquid, we will be able to make it more soluble. And again, that's exactly what happens when we bottle our carbonated drinks. So here, SG is our solubility of the gas. K is Henry's law constant for the gas in that solvent at that specific temperature. And PG is a partial pressure of the gas above this liquid. So any questions so far on our Henry's law? All right, so here's our problem. We're gonna calculate the concentration of CO2 in a soft drink that is bottled with a partial pressure of CO2 of 4.0 atm over the liquid at 25 degrees Celsius. And the Henry's law constant for this temperature is right over here. So 3.1 times 10 to the negative two moles divided by atm. And I know it's a dash right there. That should be a little multiplication sign. So moles divided by liters times atm. So this is our K value here. And this right here is our pressure. So I want you to give this a try. You're gonna put it into this formula right here. Solubility equals K times the pressure of the gas. Ah, good question. So Tasso is asking what happens when you shake the bottle? So when you shake the bottle, that's similar to what we were talking about with the Mentos and Diet Coke. Then all the very small bubbles are able to um, coincide with the larger bubbles. They grow into a big bubble and they're more buoyant and they can then float out of solution. So you're not actually changing the solubility. What you're doing is you're taking little bubbles, making them large bubbles, which then can escape much more easily. But go ahead and give this one a shot. When you get an answer, feel free to type it into the chat box. All right, so it looks like Clinton is getting 1.2 times 10 to the negative one. And it looks like Andrew got some, um, so it looks an like Andrew's getting point, point 0.012. Clinton, did you maybe mean times 10 to the negative two or did you get um, point 0.12? All right. Well, go ahead and type into the chat when you get your answer. And we will try it together in just a minute. All right, so it looks like one is getting 0.12, which is what Clinton got. So those of you who've already calculated your number, on um, double check, it looks like half of you are getting 0.12 and half of you are getting 0.012. We'll calculate it out together, but go ahead and check your answer if you've already got one. And it looks like Jessica is getting the 0.12 as well. And so is Angie. So it looks like 0.12 becomes the popular answer. So those of you who got the 0.012, why don't you go ahead and check your answer? All right, I went ahead and put up that poll, so go ahead and click in if you're ready to go over it or if you'd like more time.
All right, so it looks like everybody was brave enough to click in as you're ready to go over it. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a try because it looks like we're getting two different answers. So 3.1 times 10 to the negative 2 times 4, and I am getting 0 0.12 as well. And we'll talk about our units in just a minute, but those of you who are getting 0 0.012, um, do you guys want to check your, uh, check your calculations? So let's see, Andrew and Francis, how are you doing with your calculations? Oops, there. Oh, typo in the box. Okay, so you did get the right answer, just a typo in the box. Okay, Francis found your mistake. Okay, excellent. And Clinton, sorry if I made you feel bad earlier when I saw the point zero one twos coming in and then you had a different one. I thought it was you that made the mistake, but you were, you were the correct one. Sorry about that. All right, so now let's talk about our units. So the ATMs will cancel, and we are going to be left with moles over liters, and moles over liter is also known as molarity. So here we could say the solubility of our gas is 0.12 moles per liter or 0.12 molar. Either way works. Any questions on what we did here? Anybody having trouble getting the correct answer? All right. So next up, we're going to move on to colligative properties of solutions. So the idea of a colligative property is that all we care about is how much is in solution. We don't care about what it is. So the way I like to think of it is the one who has the most toys wins. We don't care what kind of toys you have, but if you have the most, you are the coolest. Uh, so that's what colligative properties is kind of based on. So the solute, all we care about is the quantity. We do not care about the kind or identity. So colligative officially means depending on the collection. So how many particulates you have in solution. So any questions on anything so far about that idea of the colligative properties? It only depends on how much of the solute you have, not what kind of solute. So the first ones that we're going to look at are freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. So anytime you have a mixture, anytime you make a solution, your boiling point will always go up and your freezing point will always go down. So sometimes you're in the middle of a problem, especially on a test, and you get a little flustered and you're like, oh, which one goes up, which one goes down? So the way that I have to help you remember this, oops, is my expertly drawn thermometer here. And I think about water, and water would normally boil at 100, and it would freeze at zero degrees Celsius. What we're doing here with our boiling point elevation and freezing point depression is we are expanding the area where it would be liquid. So normally, if you had pure water, it would be water only between 0 and 100. If you get below 100, it's going to freeze. If you get above 100, you're going to have steam. But what we're doing here is we're going to expand that area. So the boiling point goes up, freezing point goes down, and now we can have liquid water above 100 degrees Celsius and below zero degrees Celsius. So this becomes really important when you think about having antifreeze for your car or when you think about having coolant for your car. So the idea is in your car, you definitely do not want that liquid to turn into steam or your car is going to overheat. And you also do not want the liquid to turn into ice if you're in a very cold climate because then your car is not going to work either. So we need to keep it in the liquid phase. And that's what happens with our colligative properties. So anytime you make a solution, you are expanding the area where this can be a, a liquid as opposed to a gas or a solid. So any questions on anything so far? All right, so here is our formula. 
There's two formulas here, but they're really the same formula. So I'm going to show you uh, the formula that I recommend that you memorize, and that is just, oops, delta T equals K times M. That covers both of the formulas above. So on the left, we have B's, which indicate boiling, and on the right, we have F's, which indicate freezing. But again, they're the same formula. We can get our change in temperature by multiplying a constant times this lowercase m. We haven't seen this lowercase m yet. It's called molality, and we're going to talk about it a little bit today, or actually a lot today. It is right down here. Molality is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So it's very close to molarity, very commonly mistaken for molarity, but the difference is right here in the denominator. We do not want everything. We want only the solvent, and we don't want it in liters now. We want it in kilograms. So we're going to be solving some problems with boiling point elevation and freezing point depression, and we're going to look at molality and how to calculate molality. But any questions on anything so far here? So whenever I ask about molality on a quiz or an exam, it becomes one of the most commonly missed questions. And I thought about this for many semesters and I said, why are people missing this? And so here this slide says the dogs and cats often fight. What's wrong with that statement, the dogs and cats often fight? That it says cans, yes. When you are stressed out on an exam, misreading molality and molarity is so common. When I started asking students, why do you think you got this problem wrong? They said, I just thought it said molarity. I just didn't realize what you were asking for. And again, it's just because you get really stressed out during the exams and you easily misread it. So what I'm gonna tell you from now through the final, if you see the word molarity or you see the word molality, Stop, read it a second time. Make sure you know what it is you're being asked to find because it's so easy to confuse the two. Also, be careful now. You're going to have an uppercase M for molarity and a lowercase M for molality. So always, whenever you're like, oh, I'm being asked to calculate the molarity or I'm being asked to calculate the molality, just stop for a minute. Say, hey, is that really what I'm being asked to calculate? Because that is the most common reason to miss those questions. Second most common reason is that molality is not part over whole. We've been doing that almost the whole semester. So when we did percent mass, when we did molarity, we always put something over everything, but we're not doing that anymore. Now it is the solute over the solvent. So you have to be careful. We do not with the kilograms of everything, only the kilograms of the solvent. So any questions on anything here? So we talked a little bit about the idea of coolant and antifreeze, and it's actually the same stuff. So uh, ethylene glycol works very well as both a coolant and as a uh, antifreeze, but truthfully, any kind of solute would work. So don't tell your mechanic that I said this because they would cry, but if you were to put sugar into your car, if you were to put sodium chloride, table salt in there, it would work the same way in terms of a coolant and an antifreeze. Now it could gum up your car and cause all sorts of other problems, but in terms of being a solute, colligative property says it doesn't matter what you put in, it only matters how much you put in. So according to colligative properties, you could in theory put sugar or salt or any kind of solute into your car, but don't do it because there's other effects of you know putting sugar into your engine. But in theory, anything would work to raise the boiling point so you do not get overheating and to depress the freezing point just like coolant would do. So any questions on anything here? Yes, Tasso is saying that sensors would get messed up. I can imagine a lot of things getting messed up and as soon as the car starts getting hot, I can see the Sugar starting to caramelize and then burn and cause all sorts of problems. <laughs> all 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on with this boiling point elevation. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is just solvent. So this is, think of it as pure water. These little blue marbles represent water. And we talked about vapor pressure before. We know that if we have a closed container, here's our closed container up here, we have some of the liquid that's gonna come up into the gas form. And then if we have a lid on it, some of that gas will return back down through condensation. So we have some going up and some going down. We are at equilibrium. That means for every one molecule that goes up into the gas, one molecule will come right back down into the liquid form. So it's a nice back and forth. We have a consistent amount of vapor and a consistent amount of liquid. Now that vapor on the top, we call that vapor pressure. And that vapor pressure is a known uh, value for a certain temperature. So we can look up at say 25 degrees Celsius, what the vapor pressure of water would be. So anytime you have this solvent at a given temperature, it will have a specific amount of vapor up there. Now what we're adding is what we call a non-volatile solute. So last class we talked about volatility and we know if something's volatile, it's going to fly up into the gas phase. So if I say it's non-volatile, it is behaving itself, it is gonna stay in the liquid phase. So what we're talking about here are these red marbles right here, and those red marbles are gonna stay put. So they are gonna be down in the liquid phase because they are non-volatile. Now let's go back to our solvent, which here we're gonna say is water. So all these little blue marbles here, these are water molecules, and they're trying to get up into the vapor phase. But they're having a harder time now because they're being blocked by that solute. Hard to color over red. So that red, this red guy right here, is blocking the solvent that is trying really hard to get out. Because the red marble, our solute, is blocking our solvent, less of it is going to be able to get up into the gas phase. And that's why you see here, this arrow going up is smaller than the arrow going down. It's still easy to come down, but getting up is a lot harder when the solute is blocking your way. Now if we go on to the third image, now we have a new equilibrium set up. So here, because it's harder for these solvent particles to get up into the vapor phase, we now have fewer of them up here. The idea is they are getting stuck in the liquid. Since they are getting stuck in the liquid, they have less vapor pressure, and we are gonna to have to turn up the heat to help them get up into the gas phase. So here they're gonna have a higher boiling point because they are stuck down into that, in that liquid phase because the solute is keeping them stuck down there. So any questions about this idea that once you add a solute, it doesn't matter what your solute is. It could be ethylene glycol, your antifreeze, it could be sugar, it could be salt, it could be any number of things that we throw in there suddenly your solvent, which we're gonna call water, has a harder time getting up into the gas phase. So in terms of a boiling point, we have to increase the temperature to help it get up into the gas phase because it's being blocked by the solute. So any questions on anything there? Okay. So let's try a problem. Here we have our automotive coolant and it consists of ethylene glycol. So it is a non-volatile, non-electrolyte. And so we just reviewed the non-volatile. Non-volatile, let me go ahead. This means it does not go up into the gas phase easily.
Another way of saying that is, is it will stay down in the liquid phase. Now, the next thing it said was a non-electrolyte. So what is an electrolyte? What do electrolytes do? They dissolve. And what happens to them when they dissolve? Does they, do they dissolve in just one chunk? They give off ions, yes. So an electrolyte can conduct electricity because it breaks up into ions. So down here, let's say an electrolyte ionizes. So it's a very special kind of dissolving. So NaCl, for example, will break up into sodium and chloride. So it breaks up into ions. What we care about is the breaking up part because we need to know how many total particles are in solution. So what we were just told is that we have a non-electrolyte So a non-electrolyte will not ionize. So it's not going to break up into ions in solution. So again, here we're talking about colligative properties, and that means we need to know about the collection. We need to know how much we have. So it's really important to know if what we have is going to break up and create more particles or if it's going to stick together. So right now we're looking at a non-volatile, non-electrolyte. So here it dissolves as one chunk, and it is going to stay in the liquid phase. And some examples of non-electrolytes that we've talked about in the past, those are things like sugar, things like ammonia. So they still dissolve, but only as one piece. They don't split up. So any questions about non-volatile or non-electrolyte? So I know depending on your uh, computer setup, it might take you a minute to copy uh, all this down. So I'm going to go ahead and relaunch that poll. So click in if you want some time to write this down or if you're ready to move on. Okay, so several people saying they'd like more time. So go ahead and take a couple minutes and write this down and then we'll move on. But any questions on this, the idea of non-volatile and non-electrolyte? Okay. Go ahead and take a couple minutes to write all this down. So it's actually a very nice chapter to end with because it kind of brings together all the things that we've learned before. I think it was way back in chapter four that we visited the electrolytes. Ah, oh, the days of chapter four. I think we were way back, we were on campus back in that day. All right, I just want to make sure everybody has a chance to finish up. So go ahead and click in if you're ready to go over it or if you want some more time to copy.
right, so the 68% of you who are brave enough to click in are all ready to go over it. Anybody want more time? Anybody want to click in for more time? Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to this one. We now know our ethylene glycol, and this is the same stuff you put into your car for antifreeze or coolant, is a non-volatile, non-electrolyte. We're going to calculate the boiling point of a solution made with 25 grams of our ethylene glycol and 75 grams of water. So our formula is change in temperature equals our constant times molality. So that's our basic formula. Now we are dealing with boiling point here. So if you'd like to, and you don't have to, but if you'd like to, you can decorate this with B's right here to show we're looking at the change in boiling temperature and we'll be using the K for boiling. So be careful there are two different constants and we'll be talking more about this chart. But we have a K for boiling right here. And we also have a K for freezing right over here. So always be aware of whether you're dealing with boiling or freezing so you know to grab the proper constant. All right, so the constant will be on the table. We're going to find the change in temperature. So the first thing we've got to do is find our molality. And I know I just told you about molality, but molality is what divided by what? Anybody remember what molality is? Yes, excellent. Excellent. So moles of our solute divided by kilograms of solvent, like so. Okay, any questions about our formula for molality? Okay. So remember, now that we have molality and molarity, it's very important that your unit has the correct capitalization. So molality will always be a lowercase m. If you write a capital M, I'm going to think you're talking about molarity. All right, so now we've got to figure out which one is our solute and which one is our solvent. So we have 25 grams of ethylene glycol and 75 grams of water. Which one is the solute? All right, so I'm seeing the ethylene glycol, excellent. How did you know that was the solute? How did you know it wasn't water? Exactly. So we said that the solvent is what we have more of and the solute is what we have less of. Exactly. So when you're solving for molality, you need to make sure that you know what the solute is and what the solvent is. So what you have less of, that will be your solute. Whatever you have more of will be the solvent. So any questions on how we identified our ethylene glycol as our solute and our water as our solvent? Okay, so ethylene glycol, we have 25 grams. And we're given the molecular weight or molar mass at 62.07, if we weren't given it, we could still find it because we have our formula right up here. But since it's given, I'll go ahead and use it, 62.07. For every one mole, I take 25 divided by 62.07. And if I did this correctly, it looks like I'm going to do a few digits here, 0 0.40, let's say, 28. Those of you who are calculating along, did you get something similar? Yes, excellent. So these are now our moles of, and I'm just going to go ahead and abbreviate, ethylene glycol. All right, now we need our kilograms of solvent. We have 75 grams of water. How many kilograms is that? X. 
excellent. Any questions on how we converted from grams to kilograms or anybody want me to do that on the screen so you can see that conversion? So make sure you're able to go from grams to kilograms for these problems. So we are now ready. 0 0.4028, and I'll put a little line right here. These are our moles of solute. 0 0.0750 kilograms, that's our solvent. So if I divide by 0 0.075, looks like to three sig figs, I'm getting 0 0.5, I'm sorry, 5.37 lowercase m for molality. Those of you calculating along, did you get something similar? Excellent. Excellent. All right, any questions on how we found molality here? Or any questions on why we're putting kilograms in the denominator and not liters? Okay. So now we're going to plug in This was our formula. We were trying to find the change in temperature for boiling. Next up, we need the K for boiling. Now I'm going to go to the chart, and you'll be given a similar chart on your next exam. Now one of the common mistakes I see is that students try to look up their solute, and they look it up right here, and they say, hey, I can't do this problem because the solute isn't given. But remember, this is a colligative properties problem, and with colligative properties, we don't care what your solute is. It's a sad thing. We don't care what kind of toys you have. We just care how many there are. What we do care about is the solvent. So be careful because you're always looking up the solvent, which in this case is water. So we're going to look at water, and because we're dealing with boiling, we go over to the boiling, and this will be our value right here, the 0.51. So any questions about that idea that you will not look up your solute, only the solvent? All right, so here we have a K value for boiling of 0.51. Now the units for this are degrees Celsius per molal like so. But what I found is a lot of students get tripped up by this molal down here and they try to plug the molality in there. That, those are just units. So what I'm going to tell you is if you're looking at that being like, oh man, I'm going to make that mistake, get rid of those. Don't put those in if you think you might make that mistake. It's okay with me if you don't have your units until the end. I'm going to go ahead and put them in because they are the units. But again, don't get tripped up by that. If you think you'll make that mistake, just get rid of those units. So next up, I'm going to put in the molality, and we said 5.37. And now the reason that we do have those units of molality is so that they will cancel like so. So go ahead and take a moment and find the change in temperature for boiling. And once you get your answer, go ahead and type into the chat box. All right, so it looks like lots of you are getting 2.7. Excellent. Excellent. I'm going to give everybody just another minute or so. Excellent. And Juan, you are correct. That will be our new boiling point. Yes. So what we just found was the change, and then we'll go over to find the actual boiling point. So it is 2.7 degrees Celsius, and we're going to go with two sig figs because of this 0.51. Any questions on how we got that change in boiling? All right, so we did just find the change in boiling. It doesn't actually boil at 2.7. That would be very strange for water to boil at 2.7. 
Um, so it has changed by 2.7 degrees Celsius. So next up, we're going to find the actual boiling point. So let me make a note here. So this is the change in boiling point, and this right here will be your actual boiling point. All right, so what we need to start with is what the original boiling is. So for water, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius, and I'm going to call that an exact 100 because our Celsius scale is based off of water. So zero degrees for freezing and 100 for boiling are exact on the Celsius scale. But let's say you weren't dealing with water. Let's say that you had a solvent that was, I don't know, benzene then you would want to start with 80.1. So this chart says the normal boiling point. So you need to start with whatever value corresponds to the solvent you have. So in your homework, you're going to get a chance to try this with a different solvent, something that is not water. And again, when it is not water, you've got to use the correct boiling point to start with. So any questions on that, that we're starting with 100 only because we're dealing with water, and that if you had a different solvent, you'd start with a different number. All right, so next up, I see this word normal right here. We talked about normal once upon a time. What does it mean when we say normal? In chemistry, not in the real world. One ATM, excellent. So this is the boiling point at one ATM, excellent. I'm proud of y'all for remembering. All right, so going back to finding our actual boiling point, we know that it normally would boil at 100, and now it's going to change by 2.7 degrees Celsius. And here's where my silly little drawing of a thermometer could come in handy. You can remember that boiling always goes up and freezing always goes down. It will help you to remember that when you're dealing with boiling, you're going to add. When you're dealing with freezing, you're going to subtract. So this will be 102.7 degrees Celsius. So we're dealing with addition here, so we're counting digits after the decimal, but since 100 is exact, we go with one digit after the decimal. So our final answer would be 102.7. Just a coincidence that's the same as the radio station. But any questions on anything that we've done here so far? <laughs> All right, so we found the boiling point for this solution. Just for the fun of it, let's do the freezing point. So here I'm going to say, what is the freezing point? For this solution, I'll give you a moment to copy that. All right, so we're using the same formula, delta T equals K times M, and you're welcome to use it like that. Those of you who would like to make it more decorative and beautiful, you can put in the Fs to remind us that we are dealing with freezing. So our change in freezing, first we're going to need Kf. So I'm going to go back up to our chart. So here's our chart. We still have a solvent of water. But now we're dealing with freezing. So here is our Kf for water, 1.86. It's 
So I'm going to put this 1.86, still has units of degrees Celsius per mole. And again, for those of you who are like, oh man, I know I'm going to make, mess up with those units, just go ahead and get rid of those. But any questions so far about why we're using a different constant here, why we're using 1.86 instead of that 0.51? It's good to know in advance if that could be you because I see it all the time uh, on exams where people will plug in the molality right down there. So if you think, hey, that could be me, just get rid of those units. All right, so molality, this is the same solution, so it's got the same molality. So way back here, we said it was 5.37 molal, so still 5.37 molal. And just a grammatical note, you may hear me go in between molality and molal. Those are just different parts of speech. Just like we could talk about molarity and molar, molality and molal, same, uh, both refer to the same thing, just different parts of speech. All right, so I can cross out that molality. And now 1.86 times 5.37. And it looks like our change in freezing, I'm going to say 9 point, I'm going to give it 9.99 degrees Celsius like so. So any questions on what we've done so far? All right, so just like before, we first find the change. And so this is our change in freezing. Next up, I want to find the actual freezing temperature. So this is the actual freezing temp, or we could call it the freezing point. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the original freezing point. So here, I know you all know when, where water freezes, but we're going to go back and just take a look at our chart. So here we have our normal freezing point. Oops. And remembering that word normal just refers to one ATM. Because we have water, it is zero degrees Celsius. But if we had something different, let's say we had chloroform, you would need to start with its own freezing temperature. So we are starting with zero. Oops, a different color. There we go. We're starting with zero only because it's water. So I'm going to say zero degrees Celsius. And again, I'm going to call it exact because it's coming from water. Now I'm going to go to my drawing. And what we know is the freezing will always decrease. So I'm going to subtract. So for boiling, you're always going to add freezing you're always going to subtract. So it's a good thing that, idea to remember that, but if you ever forget that beautiful drawing, you can draw it very quickly on your paper and that will help you out. So freezing we will be subtracting. So minus 9.99 degrees Celsius will give us a negative 9.99 degrees Celsius. Now, a lot of times students say, well, hey, is the freezing point always going to be just the negative of the change? And what I'm going to tell you is it'll only happen that way with water because water normally freezes at zero. If you have any other solvent, it will not work that way. And again, you're going to get a chance to practice this with your homework. So any questions on anything that we've done so far with changing our boiling point or changing our freezing point? Okay, so let's go ahead and take our break um, and let's come back at 610. All right, so... Oh, no worries, Dravin. You just missed a uh, drive-by of Karma, the little kitty. 
All right, so let's go ahead and get started again. So any questions about what we did before break? All right, so let's keep talking about our boiling point elevation and our freezing point depression. So here it says, what is the boiling point for a 0 0.100 molar NaCl aqueous solution? Now, whenever you're doing your uh, colligative properties, you need to keep an eye out for electrolytes. So NaCl is an electrolyte, and we know that because it's an ionic compound. So here is our NaCl, and once upon a time we talked about NaCl breaking up into one sodium and one chloride. So anytime you have an ionic compound, you need to be aware it will break up, and we know it's an ionic compound because you have a metal and a non-metal. Just like you would way back when, when you were doing your nomenclature. So just to go back to a periodic table. So from way back in the day, we learned that this staircase here splits up our metals. Oops. Let me do a better one. Our metals from our non-metals, and then we had our semi-metals or metalloids along the uh, staircase there. But in order to determine that you have an ionic compound, you need a metal and a non-metal or a polyatomic ion. So first of all, any questions on how you would identify that this is an ionic compound, that this is an electrolyte? All right, so next up, once upon a time, we said that if we had one sodium chloride, it would break up into one sodium and one chloride. And we said if we had a five molar sodium chloride, we would then have five molar of sodium and five molar of chloride. So now I'm gonna say something similar with molality. Let's say I had 10 molal sodium chloride. It would then be 10 molal sodium and 10 molal chloride. The reason it's the same is because this is a one-to-one -one reaction. For every one sodium chloride, we have one sodium and one chloride like so. So any questions about what I've been doing so far? So here we're talking about colligative properties. We want to know how many total we have in solution. We don't care what they are. So here, if I had 10 molal of sodium and 10 molal of chloride, I could say that this is 20 molal of ions altogether. So another way of saying this is if I had 10 molal of sodium chloride and I have two ions, and here are my two ions right up here, I could take two ions times my original molality to give me 20 molal like so. So any questions on what I did here at the end or anywhere above? Um, how is molal spelled? Oh, molal. So molal, M-O-L-A-L, and molality, M-O-L-A-L-I-T-Y, and they mean the same thing, just different parts of speech. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Other questions about anything so far, especially this last step right here? Okay, so I wanna expand on that last step just a little bit more. So let's say that I had CaCl2, and it's gonna break up into calcium and two chlorides, oops, like so. Now, if I had, I'm going to say two molal 
calcium chloride. I'm going to now look to see how many total ions I have. And how many ions do I have on the right side of that equation? Okay, so I'm seeing a 2 and a 3. What are we thinking? Total ions, if you count up everything. Excellent. There are three, yes. So there are three ions. There's one of the calcium and two of the chloride for a total of three. Is everybody comfortable with saying that there's three ions that this calcium chloride is breaking up into? I guess I should rephrase that. Any questions about why we're calling it three ions total and not two? Because we have one calcium and two chlorides. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is say that we have three ions. Oops. Times our original molality. And now we have a total of six molal. So whenever you have an ionic compound, you're going to need to change the molality depending on how many ions it breaks up into. You need to multiply times the number of ions here. So let's try another one. Let's say that we have calcium phosphate. And let's say that I have 3 molal calcium phosphate. What I want you to do, break it up into its ions and find out what the total molality is by multiplying the 3 molal times the number of ions. So go ahead and take a moment there. Once you think you know what the total molality is, yep, go ahead and type it in. And we got one and uh, Andrew who's, who think it's 15 molal. So go ahead and type in uh, if you agree or disagree. All right, so it looks like Clinton's getting something similar. And Jervin as well, excellent. So let's take another minute or so and then we'll go over it together. All right, so how are we doing? Does anybody want some more time on this one? All right. So we're breaking up into the calcium ion and the phosphate ion. How many calcium ions do we have when this is balanced? Three, excellent. And how many phosphate ions did you have when this was balanced? Excellent, so you had two of these right here. So to find your total number of ions, you're adding these together. So three plus two would give you five ions. Any questions on why we have a total of five ions here? So now we're going to do five ions times our three molar, and five times three should give us 15, 15 and I'm sorry, I think I said molar for a minute, a minute ago, yeah, I meant molal. So 15 molal like so. All right, so any questions on anything that we've done here so far? All right, so let's go back to our problem. So again, whenever you're looking at one of these colligative properties problems, you always have to think about what compound you have. If it is ionic, if it is an electrolyte, 
then it then you need to break it up. And by the way, if it is ionic, it is an electrolyte. All right. So here we're looking for a boiling point. So change in temperature equals K times molality. And it is boiling. So if we want, we can decorate it with our B's here. And I can say the change in temperature for boiling equals K for boiling. And next up, I'm going to look right over here. And remember, we're looking for the solvent. Because this is aqueous, we know that means it is dissolved into water. So I'm going to look for the water. And we're looking at boiling. So it is a 0.51. times the molality. So now here's where things are just slightly different. I'm going to put in my molality. And then I'm going to multiply it by two ions. So I'm writing this out. If you would prefer to just call this 0 0.200 molal, you're welcome to do so. So I'm going to say 0 0.51 times 0 0.1 times 2 and it looks like, I'm going to say 0 0.10, the number of ions, that is exact. So we don't have to worry about that for sig figs. So it looks like I am getting 0 0.10 for my change in boiling. For those of you calculating along, did you get something similar? Excellent. So now we have one more step. It's actually asking for the boiling point. So it actually wants to know what that boiling point is. So how do we go from our change in boiling to the actual boiling point? Yes, we're adding 100, exactly. So because this is water and water normally boils at 100, we will take that 100 degrees Celsius and add the point 10 degrees Celsius to get 100.10 degrees Celsius, and this will be our new boiling point. But remember, the 100 here comes from the fact it's water. If it was any other substance, you would use the boiling point for that substance. So any questions on what we did here? Okay, so the new part of this problem right here was that we had an electrolyte. We had NaCl, and because of that, we multiplied by 2. And again, I wrote it all out as 0 0.100 times 2, but you can write 0.200 if you want to do that uh, multiplication in your head. And I see a question about, uh, Tasso, is that a question about the sig figs? All right, so here, the 100, because it is the boiling point of water, and that's the definition of the Celsius scale, this is exact. This is two digits after the decimal, so we get two digits after the decimal because it's addition. Does that answer your question on the sig figs? Let's see. Um, not 100 point. Oh, I see what you're saying. It, oops, sorry. You're right. It's listed here as 100.0, but truthfully, water is exact. For its, um, boiling, oops, for its boiling and freezing, only water. Everything else, I would have used the sig figs um, that's given on this table. Yes. Yeah, just water is exact. Everything else, I'd use those sig figs from the table. All right, other questions on anything we've done so far? Let's see, and also I see you saying water. Um, was that just a comment that we can only um, call them exact if they're water? Okay, yeah. So it's only because it's water that we can call them exact. Everything else here, these and these right here, I would only do one digit after the decimal. You're right. All right. So thus far, we've been talking about ideal solutions. And these are when the individual particles are separated by the solvent molecules. We call that solvated. Um, they are not attracted or repelled by each other. 
So the idea is the water forms a complete ball around them and they cannot find their partner. And I think once upon a time I mentioned that I like to think of this as the ion is like that Harry Potter that gets trapped in the ball of water and they, they really want to go to their partner but they can't find it anymore. So we say it is isolated from its partner, it can no longer feel that charge. And if it cannot feel the charge of its partner, then it cannot have electrostatic attraction. So this is what we assume in a perfect world, that the water molecules are not just a ring around them, but their entire sphere. They are entirely isolating these two from each other. So we can call these a hydration sphere, or we can say they are solvated. They are so surrounded by solvent, they see nothing else. They have water blinders on, if you will. But that's not real. So these ones over here were our ideal solutions. So ideal solutions are a lot like ideal gases. There's, they're an easier way for us to think about things, but they're not the way the world really operates. So I think when we talked about gases, I told you about ideal gases and I said, you know, this is the way your parents thought of you when you were a little kid and maybe you think about your kids, or your nieces, your nephews. They're like, you're like, oh, they're so perfect. Every time they go to a playground, they always share, they never push, they would be happy to share their sandwich with another kid. Well, that's not reality, that's just the way we like to think of them. In reality, kids sometimes push, gases don't always act ideal, and solutions don't always act ideal. So there's no such thing as an ideal solution. So when I said that the sodium and the chloride are so surrounded by water that they don't see each other, that's not really true. Every once in a while they pine for each other. Every once in a while, they sense each other's charge and they try to get back together. So the idea is if a water molecule moves just enough and these two are close enough in proximity to each other, suddenly they're like, oh my God, chloride, I haven't seen you in forever. How are you? And they start feeling an attraction again. All it takes is the water to get out of the way and suddenly, They feel each other's charge. They start feeling the love again. They feel that electrostatic attraction. So what ends up happening is every once in a while, these ions that we say, hey, they dissolve, they separate, every once in a while they get back together. So again, if they're close enough in solution and if the water moves out of the way on both ions at the same time when they're close enough. So it's a tough thing to happen, but it does happen every once in a while. Every once in a while they get back together and because of that we say that one mole of NaCl doesn't really give two moles of ions. So that's what we've been saying up until this point in this class. We said it with our electrolytes. We've just been doing it with our calculations but it's not entirely true. It's kind of an estimation and usually it's a good estimation but sometimes it's not. So we're going to talk about these real solutions. So in a real solution, sometimes the positives and the negatives reassociate. They get back together for a short time. Therefore, the true concentration of ions in NaCl is not exactly two times the original concentration. It's something similar to that, but it's not exactly twice. So everything I just told you, way, way up here, this is an approximation. It's always going to be just slightly less than that. So in real solutions, we have something called the Van Hoft factor, and I don't need you to memorize the name. Um, the idea of the Van Hoft factor is it's this I right here. We've actually been using that I, and we've called it the number of ions, but I can also represent the fraction of ions that will actually separate in aqueous solution. So the way I was calculated way back when is that we would measure the change in boiling and we would calculate what it would have been if it was a non-electrolyte. We do that division and that's how we came up with the I. Now this I need you to be able to use. I don't need you to memorize it per se. But if I ask you a question, be able to have 
K times your molality times your number of ions. This right here is background. Remember, when I say background, I'm sort of saying you don't need to know it for the exam, but I don't like to use those words because then people just do like a mental brain wipe and they're like, don't need it, <sighs> done, out of my head. So I'm just trying to show you where the I came from, but I am not going to test you on this part right here. I'm also not going to have you regurgitate this over here. I just want you to be able to use it in a um, problem. So any questions on anything here? All right, so real solutions and the Van Hoft factor. So here are compounds right over here. And over here we have what we call the limiting factor or the limiting value. These would be the ideal solutions. And by the way, SOLN is my abbreviation or a standard abbreviation for solution. So sucrose is sugar. Sugar does not break up. It's a non-electrolyte. So we expect to have only one particle. NaCl breaks up into two ions, so we would expect two. Potassium sulfate, we would expect three. And magnesium sulfate, we would expect two. So what you see in the blue box there, that is what we expect. But what we have over here, and I'll put it in a black box here, these are the real values. So the real values are the values we actually see experimentally. So on the bottom it says reassociation is more likely at higher concentrations and with increased charge. So let's first of all, Take a look at the concentration. So I'm going to use NaCl and I'm going to compare 0.1 molar and 0 0.00100 molar. So the closer we are to 2, the more likely it's going to act ideally. Um, you missed it. Uh, Driven, what do you mean by you missed a note? Was there something that you missed here? Um, the one under uh, some Na and Cl reassociate for a short time. Yes, uh, the note under that. Oh no, uh, the bullet point under that, I'm sorry. Mm, this one right here? Uh, so the one that says some NA and CL reassociate for a short time, the bullet point under that one, it starts with therefore. Ah, oh, this right here? Yes. Okay, no worries. We'll, we'll go ahead and pause here for a moment. Feel free to, yeah, let me know. Um, sometimes I don't always see the chat while I'm so busy talking to myself or <laughs> to the camera, so feel free to you know unmute and just let me know. Any questions from anyone else about anything so far? Okay. Let's take a few minutes here so everybody gets a chance to copy down. So sad, we're almost at the end of our last lecture. All good, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so here's where we were. And we were talking about reassociation is more likely at higher concentrations. So if we assume that NaCl breaks up, stays completely broken up, then we have the value of two right here. It breaks up into two pieces, but in the real world, it doesn't stay broken up into two pieces. Some of it gets back together. So at this lower concentration, and that's an extremely low concentration, 0 0.001, it's almost two. So only a very small uh, percentage of particles are, are getting back together. Once we go to 0 0.10, and that's still a very small concentration. Remember in the lab, we used to use three molar, six molar. Every once in a while, we even uh, broke out the 15 molar. 0.1 molal is extremely, extremely small, but we still see a significant effect here. So we have a fraction of 1.87 when we are supposed to have a fraction of 2. So as it gets more concentrated, these ions are closer in solution, 
And as they get closer, if a, a water molecule moves out of the way, these ions are going to sense each other's charge and get back together. Not permanently, just for a little bit, but enough that it can change our colligative properties. Now the other effect that we have is going to be with increased charge. And we saw this back with our lattice energy. So what we said with lattice energy is the greater the charge, the more they're attracted to each other. So if I look at sodium chloride, we have a plus one and a minus one. And if we look at magnesium sulfate, plus two and minus two like so. And now I'm gonna compare these two numbers right here. So when magnesium and sulfate sense each other's charge, they are much more likely to get back together and they'll probably stay together for a little bit longer because of the increased charge. So the greater the charge, the more attracted they are to each other, the more they are going to want to be together. So that's why for magnesium sulfate, we do see a lower Van Hoff factor than for NaCl. So these ions are gonna get back together more often if they are crowded in solution, they've got a higher concentration, and if they have a greater charge. So we say the number of particles present is concentration dependent and it is also dependent on that charge. So any questions on anything here? So if I want you to do the calculation with a real solution and we're gonna get a chance to try one of those, I will give you this chart and you will look up the I value, the Van Hoff factor on this chart. And you'll look it up by which substance it is and which concentration it is. Any questions on anything here? Sure we had one. Oh, thought we had a, a, a practice problem with these, so let me go ahead and put one in. All right, go ahead and take a moment to copy that and then we're gonna try these problems. Ah, okay, so I see a question from Tasso about um, explain again with the MgSO4 and the charges. So um, if we have sodium and chloride and we have Mg2 plus, and we have SO4 2 minus. We could think of that magnesium uh, sulfate being much more attracted to each other. Than the sodium and chloride because they have the greater charge. So if they get the opportunity to get back together, they are much more likely to get back together. And that's why we see a lower I value for it. The I is a measure of how many will break up. So if they have a higher charge, they're more likely to get back together, and that's why the I value would be smaller for the magnesium.